remember 27 years ago, I was trying to figure out how do I coordinate the planning of the birth of our first child, who can I get to speak for me uh, if Tasha goes into labor like the night before the sermon? That was 27 years ago. And now here we are, fast forward 27 years later, and that same little girl that I was trying to plan and orchestrate around uh, is down in Phoenix, and she's four days away from giving birth to our first grandbaby. Woohoo! We're excited about that. But I remember when she was little, I would say, um, Are you a baby or a big girl? And she would say, I'm not a baby, I'm a big boy. <laughs> okay. It's funny to watch a clip of an adult, Tom Hanks, who you know if you've seen the movie Big, that he was transformed from a child into an adult, and yet it's really important that we as adults still learn how to have fun, right? Amen? But nobody really enjoys watching a grown adult walk around with a bottle in their mouth. I mean, it might be funny if you're going to some kind of party, a costume party, and you're pretending for a little while, but nobody really wants to be married to somebody uh, that takes a bottle in the morning, right? Nobody wants to be married to someone that needs a pacifier to get through the day. And see, what we're going to see today in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is that Paul was talking to the Corinthians who lived in a society that was massively self-indulgent. I mean, massively self-indulgent. And they wanted what they wanted and they didn't want anybody to tell them that they couldn't have it. And Paul is going to come to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and he is going to say something like this to them. It's time to get rid of your pacifier. It's time to throw away your bottle. It's time to stop being an infant spiritually, and it's time to recognize that in the midst of your life, there are things that you have to absorb, there are things that you have to deal with, and there are moments in time, like my kids said to me, we thought being adult was going to be a lot of fun. And isn't it weird how you spend all your childhood wanting to be an adult and all your childhood excuse me, all your adulthood wishing you were a child again. Because it's a lot more difficult than it looks. Growing up and maturing is a very difficult process. And so today I want to invite you to take your program, your Bible or your internet device and look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 23. And I welcome everybody online this morning. I uh, want to thank you for joining us. I want to say hi this morning to my childhood friend, Sean Hell, who I saw just a couple of weeks ago uh, in Kentucky. Sean, thanks for joining us. Thank you for being a part of Vanguard this morning all the way uh, from Kentucky. And as we jump in today, we're going to answer this question. How do we grow? How do we grow to become mature, thirsty followers of Jesus Christ? And I want you to understand something before we jump into this. It is not possible to grow in spiritual maturity devoid of pain. And so I want you to understand that in a painful world, in a disappointing world, in a sorrowful world, if you and I are going to grow in maturity, we have to run toward the burning building. We have to not run from the pain of our lives. Everything in us screams, run, 
Everything in us screams, numb your pain. Everything in the world says, do what you have to not to deal with the pain of your life. But God says to us, run to me. Run to me. Run to me. And so as we jump in today, I just want to encourage you to ask yourself this question. What pain in your life are you running from? And when are you going to stop? And when are you going to turn like Tom Hanks in a different movie? When are you going to turn like Forrest Gump? Oh, I think I'll go home. I'm tired of running. So we begin today in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1. Paul writes this, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. Can you imagine sitting down this afternoon and writing a letter and beginning it like this? I want you to see these words again. I could not address you as spiritual people. This is God's people. This is the church of Corinth. I couldn't talk to you like spiritual people because you're people of the flesh. You're infants in Christ. So where in your life, and by the way, this is true for all of us, including me, where in your life are you a spiritual infant. Where in your life do you need to mature? Now, don't think about where your spouse needs to mature. Don't think about where your kids need to mature. Don't think about where your grandkids need to mature or your coworkers or your colleagues or those you attend church with. I really want to encourage you to zero in today on your walk with the Lord. I was watching my Wildcats last night, and I was thinking to myself during the game, I've got to mature in this. As they were behind the whole game, I've got to mature in this. And when the game was over, I was, I've got to mature. When they lost, I've got to mature in this. I've got to mature in this, right? Where in your life do you need to mature? In Thanksgiving, uh, this past Thanksgiving, we went to uh, Kansas City and was with my sister Ellen and my brother-in-law Steve and Jared and Emma and their three uh, children, which are our, my great uh, nephews and niece. And Watson, who is about two years old, I mean, he's as cute as can be. And they'll ask him this question, is this a good idea or a terrible idea? And he'll go, it's a terrible idea. And then they'll say, well, then why do you keep doing it? Right? You and I recognize the terrible ideas and the terrible actions of our lives, the immaturity of our lives. I bet if you could, without feeling shame or condemnation, if you could say where you feel immature, where you are immature, I think you probably have got a pretty good idea. And if you don't, I guarantee you that those that live with you do. Amen? And I just want to encourage you for a little while to think about those areas of your life. To think about the fact that you may have a spiritual bottle in your mouth in those areas of your life. Look at verse 2. Paul says, I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you're not ready for it, for you're still of the flesh, meaning you're still thinking about, quite honestly, about the fact that it's all about you. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh behaving only in a human way? We don't have to look far in the Gospels 
in the epistles, in the church today, in our own homes, and in our own lives. As we raised our five children, uh, inevitably, uh, our children would say, well, why don't I get to do that? Because, and then they would name their sibling, because they get to do that. Well, because they're more mature than you are. Oh, that went over really well every time. Try that. It won't go over very well. There is jealousy and strife in the relationships of our lives. There's jealousy and strife uh, potentially in our marriages, in our families, in our extended families, in our church family. Do you know where you struggle with jealousy? Do you know where you look at Jesus and say, well, what about Bob? What about Bill? What about Sam? If I have to go through this, what are they going through? Remember the story of Jesus and Peter uh, in the Gospel of John? Jesus told Peter, this is how you're going to live your life. And Peter's first question was, well, what about John? What about John? And how many of us need to mature in the area of stopping comparing ourselves to others? Where in your life do you compare yourself to others? Verse 4, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. These are good people, by the way. Are you not being merely human? So how do we grow in maturity? Number one, we have to recognize our pettiness. We have to recognize our pettiness. There are times that Tasha and I have to say to each other, hey, and she has to say to me, hey, I think you're being petty. And that always goes over really well, right? But the reality is when someone tells you an area in your life where you're being petty, if it provokes something in you, you probably are being petty, right? Because they're telling you, you know why things make you mad? Because they're probably true. (laughs) And we don't want to hear them. And see... That's the beauty of proximity of relationship is that God puts us in proximity with each other and there are times that Tasha and I have to say things to each other and it doesn't go so well. It doesn't go well at all. And then we have to work through the emotion of that, the conflict of that. But the Bible says that as iron sharpens iron, so... One man sharpens another. We sharpen each other. And so those close relationships, God gives us those relationships in order to help us. And here's the thing. Whoa. If we do not listen to those that are closest to us, we are eventually forced to listen to people that don't quite love us as much that don't quite care as much, that aren't going to be as sensitive as maybe certain individuals that are in proximity to us would be. Now, these people were petty about who their leader was. That was their struggle. And they held this idea that whatever human leader they followed, you ready for this? Whatever human leader leader they followed That's where their worth came from. They didn't see their worth as coming from God Almighty. They didn't recognize the incredible privilege it was to be in real relationship with Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. They had to be in relationship with the name of a leader because the name of that leader made them feel like they had value. They had worth. Now, what hinders your growth? What false thing have you believed in your life that quite honestly you need to say, hey, that's a terrible idea. That's a false idea. 
I've got to let go of that, and I've got to embrace the fact that it's just hindering my spiritual growth. Look at verse 5. Paul addresses theirs. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each other. I planted, Paul says, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. That's very humbling. It's very humbling for Paul to say. Paul is saying, listen, apart from Jesus, nothing I do makes a difference. I want you to let that sink in for a second. Because the enemy will say, well, look, look, what you do doesn't make any difference. Go, you're right. But with Jesus, it makes eternal difference. See, Jesus is the game changer in our lives. If you, if you step up and do what God has asked you to do, and you do that in the name of Jesus, you can rest assured that God will move his will forward through you. He will. And it will be worth it in the long run. Verse 7, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. You say, well, that feels miserable. No, 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 you don't understand. See, I can come and I can stand here and I can do this because it ain't about me. It ain't about me. And I can continue to do this because it ain't about me. It is about me being willing, you being willing, we being willing to say, God, if you can use me, use me. I'm available. I'm available. And listen, a lot of times in life we get discouraged, and a lot of times in life we want to give up, and a lot of times in life we want to give in, give out, and give up to all the voices of our lives. And God says, if you'll just Make yourself available. If you'll just make yourself available, I will make you effective. If you will sow, if you will water, I'll make it grow. Principle number two, how do we mature? Focus on the source of your spiritual growth. Focus on the source of your spiritual growth. My spiritual growth is not ultimately up to me. I have to partner with God. I have to sow. I have to plant. But ultimately, the growth comes from God. God is the one who provides. God may use you. He may use me. But ultimately, it is about Him through us. God is the only one who grows us spiritually, so we can assist, but God's the only one that can make us grow. And so if I were to say to you, how are you growing yourself spiritually, that'd be a wrong question. How are you positioning yourself for God to grow you spiritually? That would be the right question. And so what are you doing? What are you doing on a consistent basis? What are you taking captive in your mind? What terrible ideas are you wrestling through? What pettiness are you willing to admit so that God can begin to work in you? I can learn how to follow God, by the way, through watching other people. But I cannot grow by watching you grow. Do you understand that? I can't show up here at church and go, wow, Ann, you're, you're really growing. And, and so by me watching you grow, I'm growing. Nope. No, here is what happens, though. When I watch you grow, I can then say, how'd that happen? How'd that happen in your life, Steve? How'd that happen in your life, Tim? Well, 
here's what happened. I'm not exactly sure I know how it all happened, but here's what happened. And so we tell each other our stories, don't we? We tell each other uh, the places where we forgive, and we tell each other the places where we recognize that, that maybe we were wrong, and we, tell each, you know, we do all of this stuff. See, that's what happens in marriage. Your marriage grows as you are honest with each other about each other, but about yourselves. And then you invite God into that experience, and you say, God, we need you. We're watering, we're planting, but God, we need you to grow us. And see, I can learn how you've grown by watching your life, but I cannot make myself grow by watching you grow. I have to engage the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me, and I have to ask the Holy Spirit to do a new work in me and to cleanse me of me and of my flesh and of my selfishness, and of my pettiness. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I get up in the morning and I start to spend time with the Lord, it's like I don't really want to deal with my selfishness. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. I want to be selfish. I want to celebrate my selfishness. I want to justify my selfishness. I want to tell myself all the reasons why I deserve to be selfish. And then once I get done going through that exercise, I then say, Holy Spirit, thank you for showing me where I need to grow. Thank you for showing me where I'm selfish. Thank you for showing me where I'm petty. Thank you for showing me that I need to say I'm sorry there. Thank you for showing me, right? And, you know, one of my favorite authors is Henry now, and you've heard me say this many times, but it gives me a lot of hope. Uh, They would say to Henry all the time, Henry, you spend so much time with God. Seems like you'd be a better man. He's like, yeah, can you imagine how bad I'd be if I didn't spend any time with the Lord? I relate to that. I relate to that. Life is a very humbling experience if you walk with the Lord and you're honest. You will experience a lot of humility just through honesty. Just through honesty. Verse 8, Paul continues, he who plants and he who waters are one. Did you catch that? He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his own hard work. So here's the thing. I say to couples, well, we don't know if we're going to make it. Well, here, let me, just, let me just solve this for you. I say to the husband, do you want your marriage to make it? Yes. I say to the wife, do you want your marriage to make it? Yes. It's going to make it. It's going to make it. If, if I say to a husband, hey, do you want your marriage to make it? Yes. I say to the wife, do you want your marriage to make it? No. Guess what? It ain't going to make it. Yeah, but I'm going to be the best husband. It doesn't matter. You can't be a good enough husband to make your marriage make it if your wife doesn't want it to, and vice versa. You can't be a good enough wife to make your marriage make it if your husband doesn't want it to make it. That is the delicate nature of marriage. It takes two people that say, we want to make it. And you have to say that, right, every day. In some capacity or another, we want to make it in this area of our relationship. We want to make it in this area of our relationship. That's very, very important. So what's happening in verse 8? Here's what's happening. There are at least two people that are on this team. There's probably more, but there's at least two people on this team And they are choosing, look at verse 8, he who plants and he who waters are, somebody say it, one. We're on the same team. Now, we're going to get different rewards because God is going to reward us differently, okay? But all of us who claim the name of Jesus, we are on the same team 
Principle number three, how do we grow in spiritual maturity? We follow spiritual leaders who work as a team for God, not themselves. We follow spiritual leaders who work as a team for God and not themselves. Now, you know in our marriages, you know in our families, you know in our churches, you know as well as I do that this is never always true of all of us. Never. When you and I get to heaven and we hear God speak his words over us, here's the words I don't want to hear. Kelly, you did a great job building my kingdom for yourself. Kelly, you did a great job building my kingdom for yourself. I don't want to hear that. What I hope to hear is, Kelly, you did a good job building my kingdom for my glory. But we all know, as we see in 1 Corinthians 3, that all of us are somewhere between those two statements, right? Because, and marriage is is a great illustration of this, or even children for that matter. Well, I want my children to like me. And, And if I took a poll, does anybody not want their biological children to like them? Okay, all right. So we all want our biological children to like us. So what do we do? Well, we do everything they want. That's the best and quickest way for them not to like you. Sometimes you have to do for your children what they're not willing to do for themselves. And sometimes that that creates a consternation in the relationship for a time, for a season that is very awkward and difficult to deal with. It's very painful. It's very, very painful. And all of us tend to want to minimize pain, and nobody wants to create more pain than is necessary. But the reality is sometimes working as a team, it creates tension. And that tension takes time. To work through. Don't give up. Look at verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. So what's going on here? Paul is now going to describe to you, he's first said it's really important that we work as a team. Now let me tell you what my fear is. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, if anyone, here's this fear now coming out. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So let me stop here just a second. Paul is saying, let's work as a team. Now, let me tell you something. My concern, he says, is that some people intentionally are not trying to build something for Jesus. They're trying to build something for themselves. You know, I'm I'm, I'm watching in this season of pastors falling. And it's very interesting to me when a pastor says, well, I abused her 20 years ago. That shouldn't be a big deal now, should it? Huh. See, selfishness doesn't show up immediately. But it always shows up. Sinfulness doesn't show up immediately but it always shows up. And it shows up in, a, in the form of 
justification. Justification. Listen, all of us are going to sin. That's not what we're talking about. It's very interesting in our society now when, when I write articles and it's like, well, you know, judge not lest you be judged. No, I'm not judging. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm not telling you I'm better at living the Christian life than you. I'm telling you what the Christian life is. And you're telling me that that's judgment. Do you see what's happening in our society? We're trying to redefine sin so nobody feels bad about themselves. But here's the problem. Once we accomplish that, there's no hope for anybody. There's no grace once sin has been redefined. Once there is no sin, there is no grace. But where sin is, grace abounds more. So if you get rid of sin, you get rid of grace. Do you understand that? Do not get rid, do not try to redefine sin in your life. Otherwise, you'll miss out on the most beautiful gift God gave all of us, and it is the grace that comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? It is so, so very important. But what's happening here is Paul saying, listen, I need to tell you something. There's going to be people just like you, who are going to talk just like you, but their intentions are not like you. And you're going to be a part of those relationships from time to time. Verse 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. So what we're seeing in our society right now is these elongated uh, private things that occurred that are coming out in the public eye. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through fire. Now, traditionally, the way I grew up, people said, well, let me explain to you what's going on in this verse. Uh, some people are going to be saved, but it's, they're going to have like a, a, you know, a lighter on their backside going into the kingdom. You know, they're going to feel the flames as they, excuse me, as they step through the door, right? That's not what's going on here. Okay. There's not people that are barely in the kingdom of God and people that are way in the kingdom of God. There's people that are in the kingdom of God. That's it. Okay. But when you get to heaven, you are going to not be judged as a Christian as to whether you're going to get to go to heaven, okay? Jesus has decided that. But your reward that you're going to receive as a follower of Jesus Christ is going to be based on your actions, your thoughts, your emotions, and your motives. So it's really important that God purify our motives because that has an effect on the reward that we're going to receive in eternity. And the reality is that the people that are probably going to get the greatest rewards in heaven are going to be shocking to all of us. All of us. Because we create our own reward system down here, but only God knows the motive, right? Only God knows the motive. And that's not to say that we don't all have selfish motives. But my question to you once again is this. Are you growing spiritually mature? in your life? Do you see yourself as having arrived at spiritual maturity? Because if you do, I can assure you, you're not growing. You're not growing. If you can look around and see what's wrong with everybody else, you've stopped growing. I told you. When we tell each other these things, when Tasha tells me these things, it hurts my feelings. So how do we mature? Number four, question your motivation for service. 
You say, how do you question your motivation for service? Well, you wait until you no longer want to serve, and then you question your motive. Well, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to serve my spouse anymore. I don't want to love my children anymore. I don't want to be sacrificial. I don't want to forgive this person. I don't want to. Okay, now let's talk about why. Why? And see, when you no longer want to do something, that's the beauty. When you no longer want to do something, then you get to see the motive for why you did it in the first place. So we question our motivation. If God gets glory out of a situation, but you just get pained, can you live with that? I don't know. Be care- don't answer this question quickly, all right? If God gets glory and all you get is pain, can you live with that? I'm talking about some serious, serious pain. Verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Well, the reality is I forget from time to time. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy. And by the way, you are that temple. You're God's temple. Sometimes it's easy to forget whose we are. I know I do. Spend so much time focused on who I am. But God wants us to spend time focused on whose we are. You are his. Verse 21, so let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, God. So how do we mature? Number five, don't find your identity based on who leads you. Don't find your identity based on who leads you. You ready? Because when the person who leads you that you find your identity based on fails you, you'll lose your identity. So you know what my church experience is as a pastor for 27 years? People find their identity in me till I fail them. And then they struggle because it's like, it turns out he's just like the rest of us. Yep. Yep. And see, the way you can know if your identity is in me is that when I fail you, you don't know what your identity is. Verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or the life or death, the present, the future, all are yours. You're Christ and Christ is God's. So you belong to Christ. You're God's child. You find your faith identity in who leads you, and then when they fail you, it destroys your identity. And what God says is, listen, we are his temple. You are God's temple. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He sent the most precious gift to live inside of you. Don't let leaders who fail you hinder your spiritual maturity. Don't let leaders who fail you give you excuse not to continue to grow spiritually. Your spiritual maturity is ultimately dependent upon remembering you follow Jesus. You belong to Jesus. And you live for His glory, not your own. Amen? 
We don't serve each other because we deserve service. We serve each other because Christ commands us to. We don't serve each other in our marriages because our spouses always deserve it. We serve each other because Christ commands it. Amen? And see, like it or not, and it's okay to say not, like it or not, spiritual maturity rarely occurs apart from relational disappointment. And so, as difficult as it is to deal with relational disappointment, especially when it is with a leader, see that as God's opportunity to get you to be dependent upon Him and not on them. Amen? Amen.